Sankara. I'm the uh, founding partner of AKT2. We are based in London, in central London. We are 25 years old this year. Um, I started the practice, co-founded it with a couple of colleagues many, many years ago. Now we are about 300 people with 30 nationalities still uh, in, in central London. We are dominantly uh, a structural engineer, but a design-led structural engineer. We still stay in that discipline, and we're interdisciplinary across um, working with many different types of buildings, architects, developers, clients, geographies, but we always try to focus on the structural engineering. We're also very lucky that this week um, literally was announced the Serling Prize that we won with Grafton Architects for the Kingston Townhouse building. And I say we're lucky because it's the fourth time in the last 20 years that we won this prize, which I think is, is a marker. It's also a, an indicator of the value of the culture that the practice has benefited from in London, but also who we work with and the type of buildings we've done. So we won that, which is kind of a, a credibility uh, marker, I guess, that you know we are now here, we're no longer uh, trying to prove anything, we just know how to do the, the great work and that's what we're doing from London. I also teach and always have taught for all the 25 years that I've started the practice, starting with the AA, but in the last 14, 15 years, at GSD, Harvard, which is a graduate school of design, it's an interesting thing for an engineer to be teaching at a school of design that is not necessarily a school of engineering. And there is this overlap between that and what we do as a professional practice. And as an engineer who works closely with architects, teaches to architects, and in a way lives, breathes architecture, for you, what is architecture? It's very interesting, you know, what is architecture, and, and I have to go back all the way to why I'm an engineer. So if you are going to try and decide or define what is architecture, my own version of that is it's less important what it is rather than what it does. It's more important to understand what architecture does and what the architect is, because what architecture does historically is reacts and, and deals with the earth, de deals with everything we do, everything about life at different scales. So in many ways, my, to me, what it means is its essence is the quality of life. Architecture does the quality of life. The type of work that we do has proven that, but if we look back in history, you know, whether we're looking from a Western lens or Eastern lens and whichever ideology, architecture starts from whichever nation or style they start from, the essence of it is improving the quality of life. And I think that is what architects are and architecture is. But in a way, also by understanding this about architecture, uh, not just architects, you are playing a role in, into shaping quality of life. Yes, definitely. And I think that engineers in that sense, um, even though architecture has four or five thousand years worth of history. Certainly in the last two centuries, what we saw was as technology rapidly grew and post the industrial revolution, as materials uh, became available, science became more and more powerful. And at some point in the, in the, probably in the early part of the 19th century, the two kind of separated mm -hmm. and engineers were born and architecture in a way gave birth to to, to engineers. It was a positive effect because then science could be interpreted better because largely speaking we're scientists. But it also created a problem because it took away some of the responsibilities that architects used to have in, in their work. So as of that symbiosis, what I've said is that in the last 200 years, we as engineers and constructors became more and more important to the starting position of any architect in that we could collaborate and to push his idea further or her idea further. He always had to work closely with engineers. And that is the component that I think is the design-led aspect of what we do. And I would say that there are many engineers that define it in a different way. Our definition has been very clear. 
you know, when I started the office, what I was seeing is a technological revolution 20 years ago, the first technological revolution of its computation. And what I started to see was a lot of architects walking into engineering, a lot of engineers walking into architecture. So there was this moment where both could suffer, and I was very clear that unless we put a container around what we want to do, which is to remain really good at structural engineering to a point where we can improve architecture, then we will confuse ourselves. We will become bad architects, and they will become bad engineers. So we stuck to our field, but at the same time, as you say, that demanded us to be able to tolerate different positions in architecture. And it could be scale, you know, from small architects, big, uh, small buildings to city scale, where we've then in the 25 years worked on large scale cities like King's Cross or the Olympics, we did 10 projects. But on the other hand, we're still doing some of the most beautiful small pavilions, houses. So we could actually do that Equally, we could tolerate the idea of working with different positions in architecture. You know, if you separate it in its simplest terms, some of them are form givers, some find form, others are purists. You know, there are different places and phenomena that the architect has divided himself into. And I would always say to people, you know, in the old days, in the 10, 15 years ago, we could we were working with David Chipperfield Zahadi at the same time. This is two conflicts in some ways of the, the way in which a structural engineer can contribute to architecture. You know, one is pretty straightforward in, in what the role of the engineer is, but actually it's, it's much harder because it can be only the way it has been done before in the case of David's work because it's vertical columns and slabs. Where is the contribution you can make in light in air, in all other things. Uh, on the other side, the work of Zahadid and people like that was about making these things stand up technologically. Fundamental concepts of understanding what is the material you can use? What is the next material that you might find that can do this project, even before the project arrives? So these conflicts were, uh, or, or, or opportunities rather than conflicts, I say, because they go across types as well, you know, in, in typologies, whether you're designing a housing or museum or, or, or tall building or, or a railway station, you have to change as an architect, engineer. So in the same way, you have to respond and tolerate different positions in architecture. So we contribute to all of that. And I think it, it's, it's quite um, something because we didn't start quite like that. When we started, we were just interested in saying, let us just help architects make buildings because many of them get to a point and then they have to kill the building because the client doesn't trust them, doesn't trust the cost of the building or the contractor doesn't, says it's not possible to make. So we wanted to intervene that space. We went into that space and said, actually, difficult architects like Will Olsop at that time, you know, we did Peckham Library with him, amazing building. People said he won't stand up, he can't design things that stand up. How can we actually convince the world that, look, we're solid, you know, we're scientists, we can make this work? So this has been our game all along, and, and that has had to see many waves, because in the first, I would say 10 years ago, we were in the geometry world, from, from all of the complex geometries that people were dealing with. Today, we're facing the, the, the increasing challenges of ecology. It's not new. We're facing the increasing challenges that we're getting from that starting position of what do we do with existing stock of building. This is a, an opportunity rather than um, a, a way of stopping things. How do we re-engineer these things? How can we get architecture that can re-engineer this? So we're, we're moving with these waves of changes as technology gets more and more powerful all the time. And well, we could see that in this new wave that is starting to grow, questions such as uh, refurbishing. Should I build this building or not? Should I reuse? Or about materials? Which are the materials will have the less um, in energy impact or also which are the ones, to, the ones that are going to perform the better in the future and therefore make this a, a good project? What do you think that are the, the questions of this way? Uh, well, I, I mean, there's, there is a kind of... Uh, what I call the, the overpopulation of information. 
we're all exposed to so much information that we process it. And in that information, when it goes to what is ecology, what, how are we going to save the world, there is a lot of confusion and, and misunderstanding. The common thing that we all understand is we've got, just got to live better and, and treat the earth lightly compared to what we've been doing, which is exuberant in the last uh, 200 years, I'd say. So my, my view is that sustainability and ecology are not new, they're just now accelerated and we're understanding it better. What we've got to do is take this information and not capitulate. Capitulation, I mean that, you know, there is, there, is a, there is a field of thought that says we to get to zero carbon in the UK, for example, by 2050, 2030, we just stop building. It's just not possible to say that to me. That's too extreme, you know, it's capitulation. On the other hand, we can't just build new buildings one after the other. But you can look at the map over, over 2,000 years or so and you'll see that cities that have developed particularly in the global north, are, are very developed and have, have this opportunity to recycle the city all the time. In fact, have 60 or 70 percent of their buildings already built. How do you tweak them? How do you change them? And we've been responsible for those. some of those in London. We added 12 floors to a 26 uh, floor tower in London. We've just done the first cement-free concrete piling. So in the global north, there is a, there's a big uh, move towards distilling this noise about sustainability and saying, okay, let's be smart. What can we do with existing stock? What do we do with the new materials that might be used? So, for example, concrete currently suffers drastically from, because of its problems with cement, and quite rightly so. But it's not going to go away. And um, one of the, 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 the capitulations has been, let's build everything in timber. This is why I, I, I did some research on cross-laminated timber, and I'm just publishing a book on this, that it isn't also the only answer, nor can it be the answer. It's going to contribute towards the answer in at least, say, the, the global north. But then how do you go to the global south where the opportunities to build new are there? You know? And therefore, how can we recalibrate materiality? How can we recalibrate use of buildings, so there's multiple use. How can we increase life spans? Because one of the risks that, that I think we haven't talked about is post-occupancy. We haven't talked about the capitalism that drove us to building a new building every 25 years. Now, these are, are, are systems that we as engineers cannot change, but we as engineers can influence dramatically, and architects equally, because we are faced with the built environment which is often the biggest place where you can influence all of these changes on energy, all of the changes that are needed on equity, you know, between, between types of people and, and where people are living, and then the climate itself, because you are then contributing through science on how we could make old and new materials collaborate. How could we make a different way of using old materials? How could we make old materials more scientific so they can work in an earthquake? How can we protect people from floods? These are solutions that I believe architects and engineers can make a contribution to. So my definition of material isn't only brick, concrete, steel. I think the material that I talk about is the, th the way of thinking. How can we use computation, technology, and also the physical material, and type, and also post-occupancy data We've censored all our building now to understand how it's behaving. If you sense it now, like we couldn't sense it 20 years ago, you can understand what is redundant. How can we remove some of the redundancies? You know, We can measure temperatures, sound, everything. So I think that there's a technological uh, wave, massive wave of the, of the next gen machine age of generation that will benefit us if we use it as a tool, not as a weapon towards solving some of the, the, the bigger conversation. I should say, in this office, I'm trying to get us to talk about it as a, you know, going from green to black to green again. Because I'm thinking centuries rather than what we did in the last 20 years. If you talk about sustainability and resilience only, 
these are short conversations. You know, they're, they're policy driven, politics driven. But if you talk about large pieces, you could see the industrial revolution when we went to the black phase is now giving us a major problem. And how can we take it back to the green? And in this highly, highly complex scenario that we're living in, how do you feel uh, about education, about the environment? It's a very good question. It's a very good question, because that's where it all begins. But if you're going to talk about the education of engineers and architects, before you do that, you have to go to your previous question. You have to think about what their role is going to be in the world. Are they actually going to be allowed to do what they do today, make buildings, make roads, or are they going to have to shift their, their role and their discipline and profession to a point where the education system needs to collaborate or think ahead of that position? So I've been thinking about that quite a lot, and I, I think that there is a, for example, I, I'm not a, 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 a I'm, I'm in, the, in the tribe of, of thinkers in design, that don't believe that education is kind of the didactic position of academy. I think the collaboration between education and industry and profession is where the action is, because when you erode some of these boundaries without, uh, without damaging either side, you're going to get much better solutions, which is partly why I like to teach the way I teach. So I teach design, not engineering, because I think that the boundaries that we need to break without losing our position in each discipline, have to do with discourse and design and actually understanding and feeling empathy towards another discipline and saying, okay, I need to understand that, but I also need to push this from my side. Uh, I can give you a very good ex quick example of that. You know, if you talk envelopes, you know, skins of buildings, this has been a, a dilemma for the last hundred years. Who designs the skin and why? What is its role and function? This goes all the way back to education, you know, because in schools these days, neither the architect nor the engineer is really taught what are the, what are the expectancies of a skin. It's always left to the manufacturer. In the profession, it's the same. So I, I think that this overlap between profession and education in, in, in an envelope is very, skin of a building is very prominent because it's gone all towards the manufacturer. What we're finding is that in the last 60, 70 years, that piece in any building is left behind for the manufacturer to come and do later. And, and that manufacturer can do a good job or a bad job, you never know. And yet that affects the design life of your building. So I think education needs to pull some of that back as an example. And how can we do that? You can't do that from academy on its own. You've got to bring manufacturers into school. You've got to take academics into buildings to understand this. So I think the role of an education is at the key and the best design schools, I think, are going to have a major, there is a crisis right now, but they're gonna have a major impact on the challenges that we're faced with, you know, with, with how we can bring the world into academy and how can the academy influence the world as we try to deal with the climate inequity and reckoning of all the problems we're now having. So I, I am really quite strong-minded about the nature of education. I think there needs to be some vocational education. I'm not saying we forget history. I think it's very important. I don't, we shouldn't forget theory, but we should also temper these things to create domains where we can overlap and do what I'm describing as interdisciplinary discourses. No, because imagine decades ago, uh, we needed to have many draftsmen yes. for a project, then many computer operators. Now, in a way, we, we needed rendering experts, beam experts, but all these expertises are being embedded into technology and into the new systems. So in a way, we're liberating and evolving. Where do you think that inside Act Two, thanks to technology, now you are able to put much more human time into? Yes, that, that's an excellent question because the conflict as you're describing is, you know, um, if we let the machine take over, the humans are not needed. That is the conflict. And then you conclude that you don't need engineers, you don't have an office, what do you do for a living? 
I think that this is a, a false argument because what I think has been happening, certainly in AKT2, we invent a lot of tools, we take a lot of capacity from computation, but the computer never knows what the question was. Those are set by human beings. And, and to translate the answer so that you can actually put some moral responsibility on it rather than just understand the science and work what the computer told you, you need human beings. So what it's done is freed us up in many ways to not do the hard crunch work like drafting, as you say, you know, which can be done by computation now, to give us more opportunity to think ahead of the discourse, the intelligence, and embed the intelligence of the human way of actually designing things. And that, I think, has been significantly uh, the success of AKT, because it's, it's been able to collaborate well between technology and thinkers. And we've been fortunate that you get all these wonderful people in my office that come from all over the world that want to change the world, yeah. but they're also competent enough to not allow the hegemony of technology to take over and just say, well, we'll just do BIM. And, and, and what you describe is very interesting. I always say it's like a slice of bread, you know? If you thin slice it and you eat the thin slice, you don't know what the shape of the loaf of bread was. And, and this is what's happened to the industry. And one of my lectures is always about how do we glue it back together? You know, well, how can we teach design so you can actually just take the beam only when you want it as a human and not worry about the threat of the computer, but use it as a tool to, to do what you need to do. And as a citizen, as a human being, what, what um, would you say that is the building that has influenced you the most? You know, this is, this, this is an interesting thing because I, I always... Uh, I never translate that into one of the buildings I've done, although I, could, I couldn't I could tell you a lie. My, you know, the buildings that I've been responsible for, my office has been responsible for, have shaped me. There's no question, you know, whether it's Beckham Library, Fino Science Center, Bloomberg or whatever, they've shaped me. But the building that probably influenced me most, right, it, first of all, there is the life. You know, I came here as, from, from the Global South, from Uganda as a young person, my dad was a builder. So the smell of concrete and how it makes life better when you build something was my first influence. Mm -hmm. Then when I first time ever, I saw two buildings that um, were photographs at the time. One was um, Sinan's uh, building in Istanbul, the amazing dome. And the other was uh, over Arab's Sydney Opera House. Because to me, imagination that, that, that was uh, embedded in those two projects at different moments in history was a demonstration of progress. Both wonderful buildings, both create uh, not only symbols of technology and of their time, but they also move the industry far ahead so that we could do better housing because we were thinking about these types of projects. So these two projects, I think, have been and, you know, the Blue Mosque and, and the uh, Sydney Opera House would, would have been the projects I would select as kind of influencing my mind, let's say. But my behavior has been influenced, largely speaking, by a desire to be curious, to take risks, and to encourage people that, you know, at the end of the day, if you push yourself hard enough, I came with nothing, you will be able to create better buildings for people and more will come to you. So I'm influenced much more by other humans and different cities. I love going to all parts of the world. Yes, yes. And well, you have a, a big perspective because for one side you're working from London to one side of the world, working on large scale complex projects that are pushing boundaries. But also as part of the Aga Khan Award, you have another perspective of what is, let's say, the innovations that are coming from unusual context. In, from this double, very wide perspective that you have, what do you think uh, on how architecture is evolving? Well, I think you, it's a very good point because this is the point that connects the, the, the global south and the global north. Because the Arkan Award, which I got involved in 20 odd years ago, as I was the first engineer to be invited on the master jury. And I was exposed not only to many parts of the world, 
where um, I had never imagined how people build with just a small brick to, to some of the most complex buildings. But I was also exposed to a master jury from many disciplines, all at the top of its level, and exposed to the whole kind of advocacy of architecture through the award, where it, it is about improving the quality of life of people. I started to understand how civilization was directly connected then with built environment. That was my first kind of understanding of not worrying about doing the tallest building or the longest bridge, but actually looking at this different perspective of buildings, whether they're in Lebanon or they're in Malaysia or they're in China, wherever, what was fascinating is how the architects were tackling the problem of that place really well. And I think that that, you know, if I was to pin it on one, um, one point, which would be, say, the aesthetics and, and pin it on what some people say, you know, the notion of mimesis is what drives the aesthetics of the West. You know, this idea of art creating a reality. The East, on the other hand, was ignored on the assumption that it's not doing that, or, or even the Global South uh, is ignored in that way. The, the, the aesthetics of those places are driven by geography, sometimes symbolism, sometimes religion, you know, all those other things. So even that, that one edge of architecture, which you could describe as the aesthetic edge, was transformed through seeing, um, you know, what was going on at the award. I was fortunate enough to review and understand projects in Sudan. I remember being moved by these projects and seeing the people talk about it. So I, I, this is why I am a, still a very strong advocate of architecture, good architecture. It doesn't matter where it is and, and whether it's a poor place or a, or a hot place or a cold place. How do the architects respond to the problem of the people that are going to use the building? How are they going to think about how it will be in 30 years post-occupancy? And the Alakana Ward does that because it, it actually selects carefully the, the short list through a very rigorous process. You, you, you're part of that experience. Nobody else gives you that experience. Education doesn't. Practice doesn't. So you get that experience and then you get to see these people who built these. You see them at the winning stage. You go and visit the projects. Then you go back in 10 years and look again. I went to Burkina Faso to look at the school with Francis Kere once and so on and so on and so on. And you, it's all reinforces my my own position in that architecture and its sibling engineer is a, a very relevant uh, position to be in right now, right now when the world thinks it's going to end. You know, the, it's not going to end. You know, I think that these, these, these areas could actually take the opportunity and help to save some of the problems they're going to have. From the projects that you're currently working in, and that you can tell us, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what keeps you fascinated? Hey, you know what? Um, I mean, it, it would be, I mean, I, I always wonder why I didn't give up teaching. And, and I am challenged by curiosity. I'm challenged always by finding out what makes the other person happier, or what makes them tick, or what can I do to inspire and motivate them. So I'm challenged by thinking, okay, the current situation is that we have to deal with ecology, we have to deal with inequity, race reckoning. How is it that I'm going to um, enter that scene as an engineer and make a contribution that goes beyond making a building stand up? So I'm still quite excited by the extreme of work that I'm having to do. On the one, on one hand, you know, we're building the largest uh, building in London right now for Google headquarters, made out of CLT, it deals with all the issues of what is workspace of the future. On the other hand, we're dealing with reinstating existing buildings in London, like take the American Embassy with David Chipperfield, which we're gonna make into a uh, Rosewood, you know, in the future, that's an old Sarinan building. The luckiness, you know, if you think about it, Sarinan, David Chipperfield, and us, you know, are gonna create a new life for that building. I'm, I'm excited by those type of buildings, but I don't want to kill what I think some people are trying to do, like tall buildings. 
I think that there are ways of doing green tall buildings. I think there are ways of doing smarter buildings. Maybe we should do less of them, but better. I'm excited by all of the ones we're doing. You know, the Herzog de Muron uh, project right now uh, is, is going to open very soon. We have a number of fascinating projects with Grafton, all sorts of wonderful architecture that we're building. We open the Aga Khan Academy in Bangladesh next year. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm spoiled for choice and, and I, I am motivated by seeing these ends and then see the people smile. Not only the people who are going to use them, but my engineers who've been working on it for 10 years, you know, when we get it delivered. I think we're still, engineers are still judged by what we finished, not what we wrote about. You know, the, the project is what talks about what we do. Not only how we made it stand up, but what was the beauty, what was the post-occupancy, where did it fail, how did we go wrong in certain things. So I'm, I'm still very, very optimistic. Um, I'm still probably like a child in my office, you know, pushing people to go further with things, look for new ideas. You know, we've been, we did a wonderful bamboo pavilion for our 25th anniversary in the courtyard here uh, because I thought that we, we have to show people that even if here they will never do it, other parts of the world they are using bamboo. How can we bring it in and show people what they do in another part of the world? So we're doing all these things, we're connecting to artists, you know, all sorts of wonderful things that I'm really excited about. Uh, where I think we might have to rethink the discipline of structural engineering is how we communicate it. I do think that we are sadly still not communicating it as well as we should be we're often going and just solving the problem, walking away, but we should be communicating its impact in a bigger way, literally communicating about the story of what, what, what we do so that people understand the role we could play and therefore we can intervene early, which is how we can be more sustainable. So we've made a beautiful carbon tool to force people to invite us early into the conversation where you can measure your carbon as you're designing. These, these are the moments that we're, strategies that we're developing for communication. Thank you. Great.